So I'm very glad to be here and to have the opportunity to listen to so many exciting talks. Uh, what I'll talk about is a little bit different from, I think, many of the things that have come before, but I hope you find it interesting, nevertheless. OK, so everybody here is familiar with the uh, deputational scanning framework and the very uh, the classic paper of, of Doug. And <clears throat> what we have been interested in is using uh, deep mutational scanning libraries to answer questions about uh, protein structure, about protein st structure prediction, and uh, protein stabilization. And shown up at the top is, is one, one of our early papers where we made a DMS library of uh, a protein called CCDB. As far as I know, it's the, probably the first you know, full deep mutational scan of, of, of a small protein. And what we were interested in was trying to see if we had the, uh, um, some measure of a molecular fitness of every point mutant uh, of a protein, whether we could then use this to distinguish between different structural models of a protein. And uh, although this gives some information, we were able to distinguish between buried and active site residues just from this data. In order to really make progress, one has to look at pairwise uh, interactions, and subsequently we were able to do that in a limited context and get val valuable structural information from this approach. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is making thermostable vaccines and how we can use uh, mutational scanning to improve thermal stability. So, uh, and I'll start out with the, uh, this is basically about COVID and sub subicovirus vaccines. Now, there are already, of course, many efficacious vaccines for COVID. And <clears throat> we also know that neutralizing antibody titers are uh, likely correlate of uh, protection uh, for these vaccines. But virtually all uh, current uh, uh, vaccines that are, are available are based on the spike or the receptor binding domain, which is the surface protein. And these elicit substantially reduced neutralization uh, with variants as they come up. And so there's a need for continuous updating of these vaccines. And moreover, all current vaccines require frozen stor uh, storage, not uh, require refrigeration, and the mRNA vaccines require frozen storage. And consequently, the worldwide coverage of uh, vaccination is, is quite uniform, uh, non-uniform. So there is a need for safe and efficacious vaccines for COVID as well as for other important respiratory viruses that can be stored preferably without refrigeration for long periods of time. So the approach we have taken uh, to uh, protein stabilization using DMS is fundamentally most screens offer you an easy way, for example, using yeast surface display to measure binding to a ligand or another protein of interest. But it's difficult to convert this into a stability screen. So what we did was to start out by it's very easy to identify destabilizing mutations. So if you first create a DMS library, and then in every member of that library, you introduce a destabilizing mutation, which you can do by site-directed mutagenesis, then you can look at the effect of that mutation in the context of all other point mutants and get suppressors. And those suppressors can either be proximal or distal, and you can figure out just from the mutational data uh, whether they are proximal or distal based on the phenotypes of the single mutants, because proximal suppressors tend to be destabilizing and have high mutational sensitivity, whereas distal suppressors tend not to be. And they tend to be uh, as fit in a single mutant context as the wild type. So with the proximal uh, suppressors, you can actually get residue contact information. And distal suppressors offer you a pathway for stabilizing the protein. So this is essentially what I said we do. You make a DMS library, introduce a destabilizing mutation, and then you have a very easy uh, method for uh, finding suppressors. And then uh, these suppressors, the distal suppressors, are typically stabilizing. So you can then, in a yeast display system, 
just fax sort these, you can fax sort multiple uh, suppressor libraries pooled together and calculate the mean fluorescence intensities of binding of individual mutants and then rank order them to identify stabilized mutants. And so this is an example of the usual kind of heat map and the ones which enhance binding, right, which are in reddish or yellowish colors, if we actually purify many of them, they tend to be stabilizing. And so these are the, uh, the thermal transition curves of some purified proteins. And you can see the black one is the wild type, and the others are all single mutants that we identified from these suppressor screens, and they have progressively uh, increasing values of thermal transition temperature. And if you combine them, you can get additive effects until a few mutants, and then the, uh, uh, it becomes non-additive, but still stabilizing. So you can get considerable amount of stabilization with just a few mutations. Okay. So these kinds of global suppressors typically result in protein stabilization. And the way they function, we've done biophysical studies to show that typically these increase the refolding rate and result not only in the thermal uh, stability is increased only by a little bit, but the thermal tolerance, that is the amount of time you can expose the protein to high temperature increases considerably. And you can combine individual suppressors to get larger increases in stability. Now, we've applied this now to diverse proteins. So shown in the first panel is with the initial protein that we started out with, which is a bacterial toxin. And then we applied it to a region of the HIV envelope uh, GP120 protein. So again, you can see increases in the thermal stability to the receptor binding domain of the SARS-CoV-2 spike. And then, you know, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is just one example of many, many sabicoviruses. So there are hundreds of sabicoviruses, and they can potentially also uh, come into the human population. And we need not only to be able to protect against sabicovirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants, but also other sabicovirus variants. So we took the receptor binding domains from a number of different sabicoviruses of different clades, and in each of them, we could find a substantial degree of stabilization. So in red is the transition temperature for the wild type. In black are the transition temperatures for the stabilized mutants. And you can see the transitions are much cleaner, and they are also at higher temperature. And we can also, uh, the top panels are for these wild type proteins, and they illustrate if you keep the protein at different temperatures for uh, one and a half hours, and then look at the thermal scan, how much of residual uh, folded protein you have. And you can see in the top row, for example, which are all the wild type uh, RBDs of different sabicoviruses, they lose uh, the ability to show a clean thermal transition as you increase at, uh, incubate them at higher temperatures. Whereas for the lower panel, which is the corresponding stabilized mutants that we identified, you can see that they retain their structure even after high temperature incubation. And for a vaccine standpoint, this is actually more important than thermal stability per se. So this just summarizes uh, what I said. And really the important thing I think is that you have improved folding reversibility, not just increase in a thermal melting temperature. Okay. So I'll just uh, sh then talk a little bit about some of the actual vaccine studies and, and data that we have. So this is the structure of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And in red is the receptor binding domain, which is the target of most neutralizing antibodies. And uh, this shows the uh, regions of the RBD where neutralizing antibodies bind, and which is what we chose as our initial target for a vaccine. So RBD is about 200 amino acids in length. It can be expressed in relatively high yield. Very early in the pandemic, we showed that RBD itself is highly thermotolerant. And when it's lyophilized, you can heat it to boiling temperature for a couple of hours and cool it down, and it's perfectly OK. But the problem is it's only moderately immunogenic. And then we wanted to see if we stabilize the protein, would that actually uh, enhance the uh, immunogenicity? 
and you can also enhance immunogenicity by oligomerizing or by displaying it on nanoparticles, but these two strategies often result in antibody titers against the parts that you added, which you don't always want. So if you look at the uh, stabilized RBD, right, which is in, in black, which I showed in earlier panels, shown here are neutralizing titers when we immunize with either the stabilized, which is on the left, or the wild type RBD against different pseudoviruses. So the neutralization titers are the serum dilution that you require to neutralize 50% of the virus. And they're a good, as I said, correlative protection. So you can see that with the stabilized mutations, it, surprisingly, we've increased the new titers by about two orders of magnitude, which is you know, more than, certainly more than we expected. And if we immunize with the wild type RBD, then, which is not stabilized, then the Omicron pseudovirus is not neutralized at all. But with the stabilized RBD based on the wild type sequence, we get very significant neutralization of the Omicron. So in summary, we use this saturation suppressor methodology to stabilize the uh, RBD of the spike protein. And the mice that were immunized with the stabilized RBD did much better. Now, why does this happen? We don't know all the answers, but certainly the stabilized proteins are more uh, resistant to tryptic digestion. So in the right panel of the gel is the, the stabilized protein, and the left panel is, is the wild type. They also show a greater tolerance to guanidine hydrochloride. I won't discuss the other panels for you know, lack of time. And also, they tend to bind less of a hydrophobic dye called ANS. So essentially, what we think is that by stabilization, by introducing these stabilizing mutations, which we identified through deep mutational scanning, we are likely enhancing the in vivo half-life and reducing the conformational fluctuations in the protein, which lead to elicitation of unwanted antibodies. Now, we can also look at the actual immunogenicity of a protein, which is stored for a period of time, in this case, one month at 37 degrees. And shown in gray circles is the immunogenicity of that protein versus the immunogenicity of protein, which is just kept at 4 degrees. And you can see that we are able to store protein for extended time at a high temperature or reasonably high temperature and it does perfectly well in immunization studies. Now we wanted to see, does this increase in stability translate to improved immunogenicity for other sarbicovirus proteins? So this is SARS-CoV-1, we, we were able to stabilize that. We do see substantial improvements uh, in the yield of the protein, as well as the thermal melting temperature, but most importantly, we see as we saw for SARS-CoV-2 RBD, we see very significant increases in neutralizing titer, which is really what, what you want to get. And this is for, the again, the same protein, but two uh, different. This is a homologous neutralization. This is a heterologous neutralization. In both cases, we see enhanced neutralization. Now, we did this for a number of other sarbicovirus <laughs> receptor binding domains both uh, monomeric and trimeric from different clades of sarbicoviruses. And these are the, uh, in white are the uh, wild type sequence. In uh, the uh, filled bars are the uh, stabilized sequence. And you can see there typically very substantial increases in the yield of protein that you get. And there are also increases in the thermal melting temperature. Okay. So now, we could also look in a liquid, so when you immunized, typically manufacturers don't like lyophilized formulations. So we looked also in liquid adjuvanted formulations, and we were able to show that the potency of the stabilized protein formulation was better than that of the wild type uh, protein formulation. So improved stability results also in higher thermal tolerance, and these kind of formulations can likely be distributed 
without the requirement of certainly a last mile cold chain, which is a very important criterion for distribution in many parts of the world. Next, we wanted to further improve the properties of the, uh, the antigen by fusion to a large conserved segment. So the spike protein has the S1 and the S2 subunits, and so we fused the RBD to the S2, which is a highly conserved uh, segment across subecoviruses, and then we tested the ability of these fusions to uh, both for their immunogenicity and protective efficacy, and compare them to the full-length spike, which is the constituent of basically all uh, COVID vaccines, virtually all COVID vaccines. And what we found that, first of all, uh, our proteins were, uh, these fusions were highly immunogenic, and across uh, non-subicoviruses uh, uh, from a different clade also, as well as different variants of concern, they elicit good immunity. Both the lyophilized and non-lyophilized formulations uh, did quite well. They completely protected animals from challenge against different variants of the, the subicovirus. And this is all for material that had been stored at 37 degrees for one month. We also were able to show that uh, these are various uh, biophysical characterizations of the formulation. And it showed that even in the liquid formulation, we could get perfectly stable uh, formulations which could be stored at high temperature uh, for over a month and retain both antigenicity as well as other biophysical properties. So both lyophilized as well as liquid are stable to extended uh, high temperature exposure. Next, we did a direct comparison with the full-length spike protein, which is the constituent of most vaccines. And we used hamsters because these are a very good model for doing COVID challenges. And what we were able to see quite encouragingly, is that it was either similar, so blue is our new immunogen, and in green is, is the spike. And in many cases, uh, we perform better than the spike, which is the gold standard immunogen. And we completely protected hamsters from viral challenge, better than the spike when you look at the weight loss, and a little better in terms of the uh, histopathology and lung viral titers. So these were maybe not statistically significant. So this is certainly a promising uh, formulation that we will be taking forward into the clinic. So now I'll just, in the little bit of remaining time, I'll talk uh, about uh, mutate DMS approaches that we have been using for mapping epitopes. So obviously, mapping of epitopes which are targeted by broadly neutralizing, neutralizing antibodies, that is with ones which neutralize a range of uh, uh, variants of a virus, is important, and while this can be done by crystallography uh, or by cryo-EM, those can be laborious, less so though uh, nowadays. But what these methods can't do is easily probe antibodies that are targeted, that are important, which are in polyclonal sera, right? Because you have all kinds of different species of antibodies, and you would like to know how they are binding to the uh, uh, virus or, or to the target of interest. And there's been a lot of very nice studies using DMS uh, uh, saturation mutagenesis libraries, uh, most notably by the Bloom Lab, where each residue is randomized, and then you look at either binding or, in favorable cases, neutralization. So we've been trying to uh, look at approaches where we can considerably reduce library sizes and still get uh, information. And I'll talk about one of those studies now. So the approach we took, and this is in the context of HIV, which is a, another virus that we do some work with, we wanted to see if we could now, instead of completely uh, randomizing each individual residue, in this case in the envelope protein, which would be a very large uh, library, <laughs> if we could instead take, uh, cover the surface with single cysteine mutants, because we know what the approximate size of an antibody footprint is, and if we could put cysteine, single cysteines over the surface at these intervals, and then 
look at what the effect would be of labeling the cysteine. So you can have a, a, a maleamide, a peg maleamide, which is what we use, which will now covalently couple to the cysteine. And now you have this very large group on the surface of the protein. And if there was a neutralizing antibody epitope over there, the antibody would no longer be able to bind. So the format of the experiment is quite simple. You generate this library of viruses, and then you add the cysteine label, and you add neutralizing antibody or polyclonal sera, and then you infect cells. Now, after infection, the virus, if the virus is able to go into cells, it will replicate, and eventually it will come out of the cells. So after a while, you can look at what virus has come out, and you deep sequence that, and you see where the cysteines were. And those cysteines then will directly give you the positions of the epitope. So it's, it's a pretty simple idea. And this is the result when we did it with the uh, HIV envelope. <clears throat> These are the epitopes which are from the crystal structure for three different neutralizing antibodies. And these are what we got the, some equivalent of enrichment scores when we did the cysteine labeling experiment. And so you can see that uh, they match up uh, very well, right? This is for, for these three antibodies. And what we could do that you can't do with crystallography or cryo-EM is we could look in plasma and also in neutralizing sera from small animals with antigens that we had designed, and we could find out which epitopes were targeted in these sera. So there's close agreement between epitopes for monoclonals that we identify by crystallography and by cis scanning and labeling. And we can identify epitopes in both polyclonal human plasma and guinea pig sera. And we can use similar approaches to map interface residues in protein-protein or protein ligand complexes. So just to summarize, we have used uh, this saturation suppress suppressor mutagenesis coupled to yeast display, or it could be any surface display. It's a facile method to identify stabilizing mutations, and this has been validated in multiple different proteins. We were able to show that through uh, stabilization, we can greatly enhance immunogenicity, and this has important applications in a vaccine context, and we think this is probably due to decreased flexibility and longer in vivo half-life, and we are exploring these two things. By fusion of this conserved S2 domain to the RBD results in improved yield and immunogenicity, and it performs favorably relative to spike. And all these advantages, which are there in a protein context, we, of course, would now need to see if similar advantages also hold true in an mRNA con context, whether you can get dose pairing and so on and so forth. We've also used these to stabilize RBDs from other sabicovirus clades. And in principle, we can apply this to any molecule of interest that is uh, amenable to uh, surface display or phenotypic selection strategy. And this kind of methodology can also be used for rapid epitope mapping. And uh, we've also used other approaches using a limited set of residues for epitope mapping. And uh, uh, there, I think Kokab will talk about it tomorrow. Okay. So this is, of course, the work of a very large number of people. Up here are all the folks from my lab, as well as from my collaborators at the Indian Institute of Science who have done all this work. Um, for neutralization assays, these are uh, the folks who supplied us with adjuvant. And this is a very important thing when doing vaccine work. Adjuvants, which are essential for protein subunit vaccines, are largely held by very large companies, and they're impossible to access. So VFI, with funding from the Gates Foundation, has made some of these adjuvants in GMP grade, which are now available to, to everybody to use. These are the uh, people who developed the ACE2 mice in India that we use. And Minvax is a startup that I co-founded a few years ago, 
which has also been instrumental in carrying out this work. And of course, a thank to all my funders, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and um, some fun other Indian funding agencies from the Prime Minister's Scientific Advisory Office and some corporate funding that we got. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that an, an amazing talk there. If I can just ask the first question, people um, can raise their hands and then the microphone can come round. If I could ask the first one, if that's okay. So you've looked at lots of related viruses, you showed at the beginning. Do you see any correlation between the stabilizing variants and perhaps the ancestral alleles or ancestral residues when you look at them phylogenetically? Yes, so that's very interesting. So one of the mutations is a, a mutation not in all the, it's present in, it wasn't present in SARS-CoV-2, but it was present in a lot of other sabicoviruses. So. Thank you. So in the room. Hi, um, that was a lovely talk. I'm particularly interested in the cysteine, um, I guess, scan where you're, um, where you're blocking the cysteine. Um, do, ha, how do you cope with misfolded variants? So, so I think it depends on the protein. You know, in the viral context, so when we made the envelope protein and we tried to put single cysteines, it was a bit of a mess. You know, for reasons I don't entirely understand, we did get a lot of these misfolding issues. In this particular case, in the viral context, there was no, no such issue. So we were able to, you know, the viruses which had single cysteine mutants, in the absence of sera, they were all quite infective. Now, but this is a problem, and that's why we are looking at other mutations where we also don't have to do this chemical labeling step, which, and so we've identified charged mutations as the one most likely to be disruptive of an interaction with an antibody. And if there's already a charged amino acid at that position, we replace it by an oppositely charged residue. Yeah. And that seems to work also quite well. Okay. So is there anything online? Oh, okay. Hey, hi. Um, thanks for such a clear talk. Um, so with the increasing importance of like large uh, multi-domain proteins for like soft therapies and the like, have you thought about whether the sort of suppressor scanning idea can be scaled to those proteins or how it should be um, uh, as compared to small domains where it's sort of, you know, clear to stay full that you kind of... Sure. So I think in larger proteins, the suppressors that you would get would still most likely be within a domain. So the, your ability to do a suppressor screen would only depend upon whether you can do a display for an interacting partner, and most proteins will have some interacting partner, um, or whether there is a phenotype that you can get from for intracellular expression. So I think that's the, the only limit uh, of what, what you might do. If there's nobody else, can we uh, thank the speaker once again, please?